Anchor Studio in the great state of New Hampshire. Welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. Okay, Stump, we are live, episode 97. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hi, laddie. Happy St. Pat's. Happy St. Pat's. Are you Irish? Um, I think there's a little bit in there, but mostly German. You're you're Irish, correct? Yeah, I got that DNA test done, and uh, I came back like I think like seventy percent Irish or something. Wow, yeah, that's cool. And then that's a good little, time. Yeah, and I got a little Greek in me. I got a little Scottish in me. That's about it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm predominantly uh, German, and um, I guess uh, French. Yeah, you can still Folks. celebrate. You can still wear green. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I used to be in an Irish band. Did I ever tell you that? I used to play bass for an Irish band in Boston. No. What would you sing? That was it. It was very interesting time. I w- I was singing backups, but I was just playing bass for uh, a pretty well known Irish band. But uh, they would play all the classics, and then Irish fiddlers would join in, and they'd play all those cool jigs and reels and things. It was a it was a fun time. Yeah, when I was in high school, I worked at uh, Pr- Prince Restaurant in Saugus, the big leaning tower there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they had yeah. his band. It was the Johnny Cochran Band. I remember. And they were yeah, yeah, they were famous on the North Shore, Massachusetts. So they, oh, would for play, sure. they would play at Prince like all the time. But then on St. Patrick's Day, it was all hands on deck, everybody working. And they had that room off in the back and it would get wild in there. So I would be like... 16 year old kid just like delivering food or bussing tables and it would get mm. would get crazy yeah that's a neat place that's not there anymore no it's still there it's still there it it's is. just um I don't know I think they still do their thing they got the kids pizza parties and it seems like it's busy when I drive by <laughs> something's never changed but that strip has changed quite a bit otherwise yes yeah it has old route one yeah Car- Kowloon is uh, gonna, they, they're taking that down in a couple of years I think and they're going to replace it with like a mixed residential and retail place similar to what they did with the hilltop I think which is a shame yeah no more giant fish tanks <laughs> such a legendary place yes um, all right. And then March Madness is going on. I got to acknowledge that. I hope everybody's brackets are doing well. I just, I, I watched the first three games this afternoon while I was working and I'm two out of three. Everybody I think is going to get crushed with the Virginia Furman game. So I didn't call that one. Hmm. Yeah. I've, I've never played. I'm not a big team sports guy. Never have been. So I'm clueless. Yeah. I get that vibe from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No clue. Yeah, honestly, I was never a team sport. Oh, well, I, I mean, I played football in my younger days, but when I got to high school, I did track and wrestling and golf. So those are all individual sports. Yeah, yeah. I might go golfing this summer. Actually, my uh, my crewmates are trying to talk me into going, but we'll oh, see. Yeah, yeah. You have It'll to be a disaster. True. You can walk right out the back back porch of uh, Grandma Stomp's yard. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, they're right, uh, right on the tenth hole. I forget the name of that place. Yeah, yeah. I'll go with you. I go once a year. Maybe you should give give me some pointers. Mm-hmm. I don't know the first thing about it. Oh boy, I'm a lefty too, so I probably wouldn't be able to help. <laughs> oh boy! All right. Well, why don't we do the show intro? Because otherwise, we'll, we won't get to it for 45 minutes. And I actually put some of the <laughs> early stuff we're going to talk about in the intro. So I think that's I think that's the way we're going to do it now on. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. All right. So welcome to episode 97 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week, we are going to continue to revisit some early episodes to clean up some topics. And uh, Stomp, I actually found like the style guide that I put together just before we even recorded the podcast. So we'll go over that a little bit. Um, <laughs> but this week, the focus is on Franconia Ridge. So summer's coming. A lot of people like to hike Franconia Ridge. So we're going to put this up on the show title so people can listen to this one too if they want to learn about Franconia Ridge and do that like epic hike. So we'll revisit our advice on all the trail systems in and around Franconia Ridge. 
We'll also give some of our tips on safety, considering that this is the busiest section of New Hampshire for search and rescue calls. Um, And then we'll also revisit a little bit on the Michael Miller mystery. So Michael Miller was a um, a young gentleman that went hiking with some friends on uh, Old Bridal Trail in 1983 and was never located. So uh, I recently picked up the Appalachia um, Bulletin from summer 1994, and they have a, a detailed uh, summary of the, the seven-day search that took place. So I'm going to break that down day by day and ask Stomp to give his perspective on uh, how they handled search back then. All this plus trail names, AT through hikers are quitting the trail and they're being very dramatic about it. There's a Golden Gator oh. recap. And then Stomp is going to read a preview of the Hallmark movie script that I put together or the outline I put together called Kittens for Waterville. So I don't know what he's up to, but he said he's going to read something. So I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. All right. Very good. Um, so what's next here? So Tuckerman's Inferno Pentathlon is this weekend. Have you ever heard of this? I have heard of it, but... Um, I just heard about it today. I'm like, what? <laughs> It sounds amazing. Yeah, no, they have all these kind of races. Have you heard of the Wild Man Biathlon? No. That's another one up there. Oh, well, let's talk about this one. What, what is the Inferno Pentathlon? Well, apparently it's this weekend, and it's at Tuckerman's, and it is a five-event uh, race. It's the 2023 Northeast Premier Single Day Adventure Race, Fat Bike, Cross Country Ski, Snowshoe Mountain Run, Schemo Pentathlon Relay, um, it's this Saturday, uh, the 18th, beginning at 7 a.m. Uh, at the Great Glens Trail Center. So uh, it's news to me, but man, that sounds intense, huh? It's a beast. Is it? Can you do a relay, oh. or do you have to do it by yourself? Oh, I'm not really sure to be honest. Oh, individuals and relay teams of okay. two to five people compete oh. to see who will be uh, the fastest. Yeah, that makes it a little bit more sense. All right, so six miles on the fat bike. Six yeah. miles cross country skiing. So those are flat sections down below near the auto road, I would assume. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to do the five miles up to the auto road, Connie's Way backcountry ski trail to Tuckerman Ravine. So I'm assuming they're going to go down Tuck- the Tuckerman's head wall, I would assume, for the, the, the skiing. Yeah. And then ski, snowboard, and mountaineering, Hillman's Highway down to the Sherburn. So. Okay, mm-hmm. maybe the mountain run is like the higher higher section, and then I don't know, but that sounds wild. Oh yeah. So is the snowshoe? I wonder if the snowshoe part of this is a run, a snowshoe run, and then there's a mountain run. I'm not sure what the uh, distinction is there. Oh, mountain anyway. run. I'm sorry. I thought mountain run meant um, skiing, but no, you're right. Then the snowshoe, I bet, is probably flat. Mm. And then um, the mountain run. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, either way, you're looking at snowshoes. I mean, there's still so much snow up there. Yeah. I don't know. Looks fun. Anyway, yeah, but if the, anybody's but, doing it, let us know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm interested in that. And then the Wild Man Biathlon Stomp, that's a race that used to go on. I don't know if it goes on anymore. They canceled it for a couple of years. I've done that one, I think, three times. And yeah. that is a, a 10K in Sherburn or Shelburne, which is the town to the east of Gorham, if you take a right on Route 2, look at Daphne. Yeah. Oh, she, Daphne wants to get on the mic. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. She was trying, I, was, I just took a nap and she was on my head and my chest and I'd push her off and she'd jump back up and I'd barely get back to it. <laughs> like a, a nice nap and she'd jump on me again. Oh, Such people nuts. listening, she's like stomping oh, she does want to get on the mic. Yeah, oh, she's hey, like she literally she just hopped on the there. couch and, and put her face up on the mic. So yeah, she's eating the mic cord. <laughs> but anyway, the Wildman Biathlon is it's it's a flat <sighs> running course, so you do a ten k, and then it is you pick up the bike and you ride your bike from this Shelburne. I think it's a fire department volunteer fire department or something, or it's some shed. Yeah. I don't know what it is. And then you ride your bike up Route 2 and then take a left on to 16 and you ride your bike up to Wildcat, which I think is like 16 miles or 18 miles or something. And then yeah. from there, you then do a, th- a three-mile hike up Polecat to the summit mm-hmm. of Wildcat. 
Yeah, that's one step at a time. I'll stick with the Mount Washington Road Race for now. Yeah, that's yeah. probably enough. I did the first time I did that race. I did it on a whim, and I all I had was my old like Huffy mountain bike. So I was like, well, I'll be really fast on the run, and then I'll, I'll people will pass me on the bike, but I'll be middle of the pack. I was like the last person on the bike. I was like top five in the run, I think. And then, yeah. and there were maybe 100, 150 people. So I was in the top five in the run. Then I got on my bike and I got passed by everybody. And I passed a bunch of people going up the mountain, but it was, that's when I, I decided to get a road bike. Yeah, totally. Yep. Wow. All right, stop. What else? That's all I got. That's all, all right. I got. Well, Littleton Courier. Yes. Want to move on to that story? Yeah, yeah what's going this on? This blew there? me away. Yeah, um, I got a, a picture of the front page of the Littleton Courier sent to me by um, a good friend. And sure enough, it was the uh, reckless event with Ty. Um, I, I believe the journalist was there that evening. And um, if I remember correctly, and she spoke with us, um, I could be wrong, but I think that's who it was. And uh, they wrote up a, a front page story with a, a second uh, B page uh, article about the whole event and talked about the hike and all the pointers that Ty uh, gave out to everybody and uh, it was a really nice nice uh, article and they, they mentioned the podcast like wow like pretty intense so yeah Mike we made it a uh, front page of uh, local media I'm so honored yeah it's wild pretty you, cool you grabbed a couple copies I did yeah I have uh, two or three oh, I yeah. grabbed yeah later that week I went up to, uh, to Reckless to hang out with the Fantasy Pants boys so I grabbed a couple at the local uh, gas station oh nice Mm. Excellent. So Excellent. Um, all right, Stomp, I have a question for you. What is the biggest mistake that you've ever made at work? <laughs> well, how far back we going? Like you go early for, uh, days? So I'm not going to talk about my current employment. I've been there for 12 hours. So I'm going to go back, but you, you can do what you Way want. back. Yep. All right, I have two things. I remember early days as a PT working at a new clinic and treating a patient for like a good hour and I was treating the wrong patient. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one. Oh, yes. When I was green. <laughs> yeah. I would say I have two. One is, so I, I was years ago, I'm more, I'm not so much into recruiting as much as I, I was, but I was a recruiter years ago and during dot com, it was like hard to find candidates and I was working at an outside agency. So I was working with a candidate who had phone interviewed with this company and they said, yes, he did very well. He, they were like, bring him in for an interview. So I met the candidate in the, I, I actually talked to the candidate, confirmed the interview and then met him like outside of the the company, like a couple of days later, I was like, let's just meet and we'll talk about the role and all this stuff. And when I met the person, um, it was clearly not the same person that I had been talking to. So you didn't have video over the time, hmm. but you could tell based on the, the way the person talked, it wasn't the same person. And I was like, do I let this person go in or do I not let this? So it turns out I let him go in because I was like, maybe I'm being crazy. And sure enough, like 10 minutes later, we get a call and it's like, this This is not the same person that um, we had interviewed over the phone. So I don't know what they were doing in some kind of a bait and switch. So I was pretty yeah. embarrassed. That was bad. So, oh, jeez. Anyway, but the reason I'm asking the question is that there was an incident up in... Right here in Lincoln, I think. Yeah, it was right? in Lincoln. You want, you want to talk about what happened? Or Woodstock. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. This is this is out a couple of weeks now, but um, there were a bunch of students that came in. I believe they came from was it the UK? Yes. And they uh, they had lodging at a local hotel. Um, yeah, they were from Birmingham, and uh, went skiing in New Hampshire. And they were due to fly back, except for one problem. Um, all of their passports were shredded. You need to, you, for the show, you need to edit in Mrs. Stomp <laughs> ripping the paper. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> 40, yeah, 41 times. Yes. So they, so ho hotel staff shredded 41 passports and uh, the kids were stuck there. I, I have not had an update on this story, unfortunately. 
Um, but they were working with the British Embassy in New York to um, get these kids back home. <laughs> so wild! Like we have this, we have this thing in our office too. Where, well, I don't go in the office anymore, but we have this thing where it's like a, a box where you can mm-hmm. like, sh- you know, you put it in there, and then the shredding company comes once a month or something to like grab everything out and shred it. So mm-hmm. them, they must have just put that there. First of all, why do they have their passports? Like, I don't understand that. Well, if you if you're coming from overseas, I mean, that's that would make sense to me. But well, why would the uh, hotel have them? Well, that's what I don't get. I mean, I'm trying to find it here. So they were at the Kangamangas Lodge in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Um, I don't quite understand. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? My guess is that maybe the chaperones were like, "We want to have all the passports," and then they asked like somebody in the hotel to say like, hey, can you store these in a safe place? <laughs> and then they put them in some closet to get cleaned out. And, <laughs> oh boy, I mean, it happens. But my understanding is is that they then had to call an audible, take the kids down to New York City, go to the British Embassy to get emergency passports put together. The parents are probably scrambling to get whatever paperwork they needed to get. Um, but hmm. the kids got a free trip to New York that they weren't planning to because there's some pictures on the article like they're in like Times Square having the time of their lives. So, You know what's interesting? It, it, I always go to the comments section in this and several of the comments say it's they weren't, sto- they weren't stolen. Oh, I'm sorry. They weren't shredded. They were stolen. It's a common scam that happens at these places. Really? Yeah. That's... that's the first dozen or so comments are saying that it's probably a stolen situation. Um, so yeah, anyway, who knows? It's, it's a very interesting story, but yeah, (laughs) extremely odd and extended vacation. Let's just say that. Yeah. Well, so stomp, (laughs) now we know stomp worked on the wrong patient and then I got bamboozled (laughs) by a, by a potential job interviewee. So anyway, um, oh, well. All right, so moving on, um, Stomp, we have the oldest female on the Appalachian Trail to complete a, you need to clarify the rules here. So this, she's 76 years old, Mm -hmm. and she started the trail last year. So apparently, the and I don't understand the rules here, but apparently she's trying to complete the trail within one one like year not a calendar year but like 12 months from since she started so she did 1100 miles to start with then she went she had 800 miles i don't know she had a bunch she did a bunch of miles early and then she had to get off trail and now she's got 300 miles to go but she only has 30 days to do it so she's got to hike 10 miles a day she's 76 years old and you can follow her journey on her facebook page Huh. So, um, and her, her trail name is Birthday Girl. So it looks like she's already been up to Katahdin. She's just got to finish. So she's trying to finish before her birthday? She's trying to finish is in like a, idea? In, within 12 months. Yeah. So she started on her birthday. I have no idea when her birthday is. I think that's the gist of this story. All it right. is. I don't know. Huh. You know what? She's 76 years old. She can do what she wants. <laughs> 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 she's got purple hair. I like it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah oh my goodness yeah more power to you there's a nice uh, interview with her she does have purple hair gee whiz she does look at her she looks like uh, she doesn't look 76 she looks pretty sprightly but she um, she was in Massachusetts so she was doing a section in Massachusetts I don't know what else she has left I hope she's not going north she better be going south because mm, it's still pretty rough out there yeah alright so congratulations birthday girl um <laughs> Keeping on with the Appalachian Trail stop, so I haven't really been paying attention, but I did specifically for the show, I went on to, over the weekend, there's these Facebook groups that you can go on that are like, it's Appalachian Trail, like, through hiker class of 2023. So they call them like, you're in the the hiking class, they call it. So um, these groups are super interesting because you'll have all of these people that are so excited in like October and November and December. And then as the hikes approach in March, you'll, you, you sort of, 
see these people that are like, I'm so dialed in and ready to go. And then inevitably, like some of them just don't have a good time. So two people have quit very dramatically on the Facebook group page in the last day and a half or two or so. So I wanted to just sort of give you the rundown stomp. I know you, you like mm-hmm. the drama. Yeah, let's hear it. All right. So one gentleman posted that he had back pain and that his back was too heavy because it was 26 pounds. And then, uh-huh. so everyone's like, oh, that stinks, blah, blah, blah. And then some, somebody went back into his history in the group and they were like, wait a minute, like a month ago, you posted that your base weight was eight and a half pounds. So what what are you carrying? You know, why are you carrying an extra, whatever, 15 pounds, um, which must be food and water or whatever. So then he got mad and he's like, don't question me. He was like, if I wanted to go, he said something about if I needed to go ultra light, I'd have to spend $5,000 on a new new equipment or whatever. So somebody's like, well, you already said you were at eight and a half pounds. Like, what's the problem? So then he was like, I've got depression. And everyone's like, oh, okay, never mind. But it was just very dramatic and funny. (laughs) At first, anyway. Then it became sad. Um, Another hiker, this was an interesting one. So he was like, I'm pausing on my hike. And he said he had knee injury, which happens, you know, you push yourself a little bit too fast. Uh, But he had said he was like, um, I just want to warn people that all these YouTubers that make the Appalachian Trail look like it's all this rosy picture about the trail and fun times. um, Don't expect it to be like that. It's it's a lot harder and sucks a lot worse than people like let on in their YouTube videos. I got a, I got, I got fooled by YouTube. (laughs) Wow. Interesting. So, yeah, understandable. Yeah, well, you know, so if if you're relying on YouTube to make the determination of what these hikes are like, you're going to be in mm. for some disappointment. YouTube versus reality. I think that applies to any activity that you're just starting out. True. Yeah. But yeah. this this gentleman, he said that he's going back home to rehab his knee, then he's going to be going up to Harper's Ferry and then hiking like southbound to close out that section and then flip up to the north. So we'll see. He could be, he put together a nine point plan, which in, involved like rehabbing his knee, working out, saying his prayers, eating vitamins. So he'll be ready to go to get back on trail. <laughs> it's very entertaining. <laughs> oh boy, it's great. All right. Well, <laughs> speaking of knee pain stomp, so I don't think we've officially <laughs> talked about this but we both got into the mount washington real um road race i don't think we have talked about it maybe we posted about it i think i might have thrown it up on like the insta story or something like that but yeah yep. haven't talked about it yet but yeah. yeah we're in we're screwed yeah we doomed the reality hit me after i got that email like oops <laughs> i guess i gotta start running i know <laughs> i know i'm like oh boy i gotta do this yeah. again so i've been hitting the treadmill at home yeah a lot and then I'm I'm like I gotta lose fifteen pounds. I'm like I got a little I got a little husky over the winter break. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So but you've already been running. See I I let go of running a long time ago, especially after my hip replacement. Mm-hmm. So for me it's been a mind blender. How's your training going? Have you hit like two hours on the treadmill? Or? No, no. I'm just doing like I'm doing my normal five mile runs around town and then what I'm doing is uh, right now I'm walking on the treadmill, so I'm doing like one hour sessions at like 12% grade and just walking yeah. out, doing a little bit of run, but I'm also dieting, so I'm doing my like, basically only eating chickens because I want to get down a little bit. I mean, I'm not, I just want to lose a little bit of weight, but I'm not going to talk no, about what I'm doing for a diet because Sarah's going to yell at me. I don't uh, blame you. I'm trying to trim down a little bit as well. Yeah. I, I've just, after my first few weeks of um, training for this, I've determined that I'm not going to go crazy. I just want to finish the race and have fun and not get injured. Um, so I'm not going hard, hardcore about it, but um, I am trying to do what I can to get back to an actual, uh, like a, a gentle jog. Mm-hmm. But right now I'm at the point where I'm just like doing jogging and speed walking, jogging, speed walking. I, I'm not going to do a treadmill. I'm just so, I can't do it. I I don't want to, I've always had an issue with treadmills in terms of 
how they translate to actually running up a hill. So I'm actually just sticking to the hills and I'm just doing hill loop, hill laps and stuff like that. And right now it's on snowy trails, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and we'll have yeah. to, um, I know uh, Lil Squirt Tracy is in, so we're going to have to coordinate mm-hmm. something and maybe Captain Chris will meet us up there and we can all hike down or something. So we'll see. Sure, sure. Yeah. I, re- I thought that they don't let you do that, or at least they discourage it. But What's that? I'd be uh, hiked down. Well, I mean, I've hiked down multiple times. Like, I've gone down Nelson Crag. Um, yeah. Plenty of people, yeah, a lot of people go down the road, no problem. So, I've Interesting. done that. Okay. Yep. So, we have two months to go, essentially. Two, two months two to go. Half. So, um, get used to us talking about the Mount Washington Road Race. Mm-hmm. All right, so awesome. next up here is uh, Larry DeLong, Sean Mahoney. Um, I had emailed him, but I emailed another Sean that I have in my um, outlook. I was looking at this the other day, and I was like, oh, I, I didn't hear back from him, so that was my fault. But Sean Mahoney, Larry DeLong, he's got a fundraiser. Um, he is on the Pacific Crest Trail, so he's his fundraiser is to support children and veterans charity. So we're going to pin that, and then I'm going to email him and see if I can get him on the phone for five, ten minutes on his hike and see if I can just get us a quick update for the show. Awesome. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yep. Yep. So, so donate we'll, if you can. We'll provide the links. You can check it out. He, he goes into a, a bit more of an in-depth uh, resume and talks a little bit about his prior efforts. Yep. raising money yeah we'll post this across our socials and then stomp we should we should dip into the um account and uh, throw a little bit his way as well yeah sounds yep. good very good very good and then uh the last thing in through hiker news just to give people a heads up um new hampshire hiker um do you know her i'm aware of her i've never met her yeah person. i never met her either but um she is uh, pretty good YouTuber. I like her. I like sort of her vibe. She's like no nonsense, and um, mm-hmm. but also has a good sense of humor, and she's got good gear tips and stuff. But she did the Appalachian Trail in I think 2021. Oh no, it was, maybe it was last year. She's going. She's going out again. So she's hitting the trail this week. I think. Awesome. So if you're That's looking great. for a good, um, if you're looking for a good YouTuber, I don't think that she makes it all like rainbows and unicorns, um, but. You know, she's, mm-hmm. she's got good good content, so definitely worth checking it out. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to follow her along. Epic. Let's dive into some White Mountains history, shall we? And then, Stomp, the other th- uh, I had a little bit of a history tidbit for you. I was digging around... Um, doing some research, and I came across the AMC, the Appalachian Mountain Club Bulletin from 1895. Wow. Yeah, so I was the reading bulletin. through. Hmm. Yeah, it's on, it was on Google Books, so I was poking through, and I was reading about Mount Shakora, and they were, there was a gentleman by the name of John Coleman Adams, who I think, I think his deal is he was a preacher... John Coleman Adams, he was born in Malden, Massachusetts, graduate of Tufts, and he was a theology major. He was a pastor in Universalist Church in Newton, and then he lived in Lynn, so he was a, when he was representing your town. Huh. Lynn Lynn. Yeah, but somehow he made his way. He was involved in the Appalachian Mountain Club, and he put together a... Uh, an article about Mount Shakora and the start of the article, he threw out an interesting little tidbit that I didn't know. Remember how Mount Shakora, the story of Shakora, how they had like the, the toll road where it was like only one way to get up there and you had to pay like 25 cents to get to the summit. Correct. Yeah. So this caused a problem amongst the local farmers. Once they started, you know, the area started getting busier and busier with, uh, with people settling in there there was some issues with the local farmers that had to get up there and they, they wanted to harvest blueberries up on the, um, you know, the side of the mountain, right, right below the summit. They mm-hmm. were charged the, the toll. Apparently they tried to negotiate something where they could get an exemption. They couldn't get an exemption. That was like basically a monopoly to get up there. Um, 
So a a few of the farmers got together and decided, screw them, we're just going to cut our own trail. So the Brook Trail, which is the trail that kind of goes off the, I guess it would be the northwest side of Chikora is my best guess. The, uh, The farmers got together one day and decided that they were going to build an alternate route. So Mm -hmm. they basically stuck it to the Monopoly and went up there with axes and built their own trail, which is now called the Brook Trail, which is, we talked about it on the Terrifying 25, but that's how they avoided paying the toll. And, um, you know, that's how the the trail system started in Chikora outside of, um, I think the main trail was the Liberty Trail, which was Jim Liberty had created Mm -hmm. that. That's really neat. Cool story. Yep, so... Pushing back against the man back in the day. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's always a way. Yeah. The other really interesting thing <laughs> about this article stomp or this this chapter was that Joan Coleman Adams did a little bit of a reflection around like his day. So he he basically was talking about how he did the hike up, uh, hike up the Brook Trail. Mm-hmm. And this is, listen to this quote. So this is a little bit long, but I'll go quick. There is an immense, though unrecognized, therapeutic quality in this deep silence of the forest and the absolute rest it gives to the ear, the slackening of all tension on the auditory nerve, the cessation of all the noises which attack and exhaust the brain in the rush and confusion of daily life. I suspect that a good many people whose illnesses are set down to other causes are simply suffering from the din and racket of modern life. Hmm. So essentially what he's saying is that like you got to get outside and touch some grass to keep yourself sane from the the daily grind. Right. Absolutely. Look up, look up to the heavens. Yeah. So this guy was talking about that. I love, I love going back and reading these old books from like, you know, over a century ago because it gives you a perspective that the problems that we deal with and the sort of psychology that we have to think through today they already had it covered. So things mm-hmm. may seem like they're dire, but you know, 1895, they were, they were talking about the same topics. Right. Yep. Finding peace and solitude in nature. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was interesting, right? Yeah. It's super cool. Awesome. Um, and then the last thing we have here is Martin Pisani. Um, mm. And our friend Keith Gentili are doing a combined virtual event, which I think is, is it April 4th at 7 p.m. Yes. stop? That's correct. Yeah. Excellent. So we're going to get that out on our socials and we will get that out on the show notes as well. And then I'll be dialing in on that. Stomp, I don't know if you'll be joining. I don't know what you got going on that night, but I'll be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I'll, I'll try my best. Okay. Sounds like a great time. Yeah, yeah, and that'll. Be, I think those two will have a lot of good, good stories, a lot of good advice, and be a fun night. Mm-hmm. Well, um, all right, stop. Next thing, you got a fun thing to do here, Tenny Mountain. There's tubing going on. Yeah, well, we all know now that Tenny's open this season under new management, and mm-hmm. uh, it's for open for skiing. A little late now, but I mean, we still have time for the season, some spring skiing. But they have um, mountain tubing for twenty five bucks for two hours there, which I learned about, and. Um, the tracks are, you know, carved or, you know, concave, so they're safe and uh, looks like a great time. So if anybody's looking for something fun to do, hit Tenny. Excellent. Hey, what's that sound? It must be time for the pop culture segment with Mike and Stump. Just a quick re- review of uh, the Golden Gators. I th- thought it was a success and um, got a lot of feedback. That was our award, our mock Oscar award show last week. And uh, we gave out 48 different awards to some inanimate objects, but to some actual people. <laughs> so uh, it was fun. Any feedback on your end, Mike? Yeah, no, I got a lot of messages saying people liked it. They loved the editing. They loved the uh, the award show soundtrack and the vibe <laughs> and, and stuff. And then Lynn and Mrs. Stomp did great with their announcements in their uh, paper ripping. And then our voiceover guy, what's his name? 
Paul. Paul. Paul Bisson. What a hero. Yeah, yeah, S-S-O-N. Oh, yeah. he's great. Yeah. Yeah, he cranked that out too. I, I, I sent him an email and said, hey, could you do this last minute? And he got it done within 24 hours. Um, so, super cool. Yes. We'll, we'll probably do it again. I mean, who knows? We'll see what happens. But yeah. uh, I think it's a, a good way for the community to sort of fine tune what's going on out there in terms of their interests and whatnot. And, uh, I did find out that happy the dog is, uh, Gavin. He's one of the, uh, the, uh, misfit Avenger crew, uh, players. So he's out there uh, now doing the AT apparently, but his dog is happy the dog. So there you go. Happy the dog. Yeah. Right. Maybe I'll meet happy someday. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> So there's a show on Netflix called Outlast, and um, I binge watched this. I think I was just in the house one day, and I just watched the, uh, I think it's like eight episodes or something like that. So I think I knocked it out mm-hmm. in like a day or two. Uh, but I had messaged you, and I said, Snop, you got to watch this. So my opinion is it like, it combines the best of Survivor and Alone, because it's sort of the same it's sort of the same area as Alone. So it's like in Alaska, along a river. Um, and then you've got to do this like long hike at the end. So that's a similar vibe to alone, but then there's a team aspect because you have to stick with the team and they've got like kind of a survivor feel and then mm-hmm. stomp you had written and you're totally right that it's got a hunger games type of vibe to it as well. Yeah. I mean, they have the, uh, the gear drops coming in by these parachutes and, um, it's interesting. I mean, there's no violence or anything like that, but you have some teams sabotaging the other teams, and I like it. I think we're two or three episodes in. Uh, Mrs. Snop and I started watching it, and it is, it's cool. I don't generally go for those types of shows, but this one's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, no, I liked it. I, I, I was very engaged, and it's very interesting. There's a, there's a weird dynamic that goes on with one group that, like, behaves really poorly, and mm. then somebody turns around and does it to them and then they they are like super offended and very pious yeah. about how dear anyone could do that to me and I'm like you just did the exact same thing to another group but now you're complaining it's very interesting human nature yeah yeah that's crazy yep so outlast on Netflix I highly recommend it and then the next <laughs> one here stomp you've got something you want to do with the kittens for Waterville you you put my you put my so I put together like an outline <laughs> of the movie. You took yeah. the outline, put it into Chat GPT, and then asked them to build the script. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because this was part of the uh, the Gator Award effort. We were trying to get uh, you know a, just a mock goofy ad for uh, what's what's the old title? Because Chat GPT came up with a new title. Is it? I think it was Kittens, Kittens for, for Waterville? Waterville. Yeah. Okay. So Chat GPT came up with its own title. It, I guess it likes it better. It's called Ski, Skiing with Kittens. Oh, I like that. <laughs> and uh, it didn't do a, a bad job. I, I, there, there are two little excerpts here, but I think I'll just read the second one. Um, so here we go. Here's the neighbor lady and your, your heroine in the story. Uh, okay. Her name is Sue, correct? Yes. Okay, so here we go. So neighbor lady knocks on the door. Neighbor lady. Hi there, I'm your neighbor. I saw you driving up with your cats. Hi, I'm Sue. I'm Mary. What a what's a beautiful girl like you doing alone? Oh, just taking a break from work. Well, why don't you come skiing with me? I know some nice men I can introduce you to. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know. Come on, it'll be fun. You need to get out and enjoy life. All right, sure. So parentheses Sue is shown getting ready to go skiing and accidentally opens the door letting Daphne the cat loose and Sue says oh no Daphne cut to a cat chase on the mountain with Sue causing crashes and then Sue calling the police hello I need help my cat is stuck in a tree <laughs> Yeah, it's like so. I inserted the um, I inserted the neighbor as like the sidekick that like is the connection to the community. Um, yeah. So anyway, but oh, Daphne's the, always causing trouble. Yo, know, totally. I, it's hilarious. On the on the prior excerpt, there is one funny thing where the sister says to Sue, uh, like the sister's trying to talk her into taking a vacation, and Sue's hemming and hawing, like, oh, I don't know. And then the sister says, "Come on, I'll even pay for your condo at Waterville Valley." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like, wow, did you, you didn't have that in the screenplay, did you? I had something like that, like offering really? to like send her off for a holiday or something. So, anyway. Oh, it just sounds funny. Like they're going to buy her a condo or something. <laughs> right. One of these days I'm going to just, I'm going to write the whole script. I'm not using chat GPT, but I'll write the whole script and release it to people and they can, maybe we can have Mrs. Stomp do a dramatic reading. Oh, or somebody, yeah. It was just so funny. But just the title, Skiing with Kittens, that's just great. Like, oh my goodness. It's got the Hallmark Channel on it, so. Yeah. Um, all right, Stomp. Um, now we're on to our sponsors. Yeah, we have a brand new sponsor. Ooh, I'm psyched exciting. to talk about this one. So, Bay Slate Coasters, I think people are going to really dig this. So base slate coasters create unique, beautiful, functional, and expertly laser engraved coasters with topographic maps of the 4,000 footers of New Hampshire and more. So these coasters are made uh, on Cape Cod from slate, quarried in the U.S., and provide a durable and heat-resistant surface for your drinks. So each coaster features intricate detailing of any mountain topography for the location of your choice. How cool is that? Base Slate Coasters will work with you on your custom hand-designed coasters for any street or topographic map. Let's just say anywhere on Earth or beyond. So visit baselate.com today to explore a full range of topographic map coasters. Use the code SLASHER10 at checkout for 10% off your first order. So that's S-L-A-S-R, the number 10, SLASHER10. So welcome aboard uh, Base Slate and we're... Uh, Hope you get some uh, listeners checking in. I think that's super cool. Yeah, sounds awesome. Yeah, it really is. And uh, we also have another sponsor here, CS Coffee. So CS Instant Coffee. Zero waste instant coffee that comes in compostable packets, perfect for the trail and home. Each packet makes about 20 ounces of coffee, so you can take one of them on an overnight trip, and it makes two pretty good-sized cups of coffee. Put it in your backpack, find some hot water, and you're good to go. Learn more by going to our show notes or Google CS Instant Coffee. That's www.csinstant.coffee. And of course, you can get your stickers by signing the uh, the form that we have up on our website. Um, you can go to Ski Fanatics off of Exit 28 in Campton, New Hampshire, or head down to Spinners and say hi to Dolls and Pops at Spinners Pizza Parlor, which is off of Dascom Road, and uh, get some great uh, Italian food while you're there. Um, yeah, that's about it. And anybody that's interested, plenty of advertising options and opportunities if you want to jump on board with Slasher. Yeah, Stomp, and I was looking at this Base Slate Coasters. Uh, I was looking yeah. at their website earlier, and it's really cool. They they are they have it's like amazing. pre-made 4,000-footer coasters. So basically what it is, it's a coaster, um, and on the bottom, it's got like the cork um, coverage on each corner, and then it'll say the mountain, and it'll give the elevation, which is really cool. And then on the top is the topography, so it's got the, the topography line. So <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. Oh, it sure is. Yeah, I think it's going to be a hit here for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the right audience. Yeah, it certainly is. So I highly recommend it. We'll get that out on the show notes as well. Mm hmm. I've got some donations. Okay, go ahead. Gwen Stratton donated 20 coffees. Um, again, the, the high roller uh, donations keep on coming in, and we're just overwhelmed. Thank you guys so much. It's super, super generous. Helps us do a lot of things behind the scenes uh, to keep the podcast going and to boost the content and the quality. So really appreciate it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Kim Chandler uh, from Covered Bridges of New Hampshire donated oh. three. That She may be a future guest soon. Uh, she has a great website on Insta that you should be aware of uh, by that name, Covered Bridges of NH. You have Mac the Belgian Malinois who donated five. And uh, a special shout out to Paul for the birthday Fugaki gift card for me and Mrs. Stomp. Can you believe this? Oh, wow. Some really cool stuff here. So, Paul, thank you very much. That's super cool. Did you guys get Mai uh, Tais? That's the word oh, around town. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have uh, Jennifer Lee Mountain donated five. Paul Noel, New Hampshire Wild donated five. Evelyn Aissa, A-I-S-S-A, Aissa donated five thank you evelyn and someone some anonymous someone donated one saying love your podcast so thank you everybody super wow. cool 
Thank you so yeah. much, everybody. That's amazing. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, yeah, and this is this tis the season for Forty Eight Peaks Alzheimer's. They're really ramping up their efforts here. Um, so, two things. So, hike to fight Alzheimer's with Forty Eight Peaks, a fundraising and awareness event for the Alzheimer's Association. Join four hundred fifty plus hikers this summer as we hike New Hampshire's four thousand footers, or create your own hiking adventure from a fifty two of the view to a Prezi Traverse, or climb your favorite mountain. Together, we will paint the mountains purple and raise vital funding to advance the care, support, and research efforts of the Alzheimer's Association. <gasps> Visit alts.org, that's A-L-Z dot O-R-G, right slash 48 peaks. That's the number 48 and then peaks to learn more. And I just wanted to read something here that's really cool. This message came in from um, a handle on Insta that is B-K Aferte, B-K-A-F-E-R-T-E. And this person writes, just learned about the show last week, gone through about 40 episodes, and after hearing the Alzheimer's episode from last year, immediately signed up with Megan for this year's event. Hiking and Reckless. What's better than that? Good stuff, guys. Keep it up. So thank you very much, BK. That's super cool, and we're glad you're joining in on that uh, event. That's awesome. And if Megan's listening, I am going to get my act together. I'm going to organize my crew. I got to do that. Um, mm. So mm. I got to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I'm spinning music for that, I, I believe, weather pending. So that should be cool. Oh, great. But um, so I'm not sure if I can make the hike because of that, but we'll see. Okay. Um, I, it, we, I just have to say thanks to Reckless um, because that Thai thing was fantastic and uh, they're. They remain a great uh, supporter of the community and all the different things that happen. Thank you to our sponsor, Reckless Brewing, where you'll enjoy the best food, craft beer, and fun just 15 minutes from Franconia Notch, many 4,000 footers, and less than 10 minutes from the five corners. Visit them online at recklessbrewing.com, R-E-K-L-I-S, brewing.com. Very good. And speaking of beer, Stomp, this is the section of the show where we normally talk about what we're drinking. <laughs> I am on the wagon for drinking for the next two months or so just because I got to stay disciplined, drop a few pounds so I can do the Mount Washington yeah. race. Nice. So I'm drinking water. I'm not drinking anything tonight, but I may not be as regimented as you. Okay. We shall see. Well, I will say if I end up at <laughs> Reckless for some reason, that then all bets are off. Right, 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 right. It's all within reason. So for the audience listening, just a heads up, like we normally record at like 6.30 or 7, but tonight I was like, let's start at 6 so we can get done early. We're not going to get done early. Um, <laughs> Stomp didn't show up, so I had to text him. I'm like, where are you? And he was like, oh, I was taking a nap. So I'm like, oh, he's taking a nap he knew at like 6 o'clock at night. What's going cool? I I never do that. Oh, man. I, I, I swear to God, I feel like I have jet lag. Last week was so rough. It was the busiest week I've had in, in forever. And, uh, it, you know, what killed me was editing the uh, the Gator Awards because I was up till two in the morning Thursday night and got up at six. And um, I was I swear to God, I've not been the same since that. Oh, yeah. That Gator, <laughs> that show was like your magnus opus. I think so, yeah. It was, well, it's really funny. It's like I'm not... I'm not putting myself in this category by any means, but I believe it was one of the famous sculptors who said that they they could see the image inside the rock or the stone, and all they had to do with, was release it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying I'm a, a famous sculptor, but I had the vision for oh, it. Yeah. It worked out so perfect. I was really happy it came out as well as it did. But yeah. uh, any, anywho. Yeah, I take like zero credit for the gate, like you know, Stomp and the <laughs> editing, Lynn and the organizing, Mrs. Stomp with the paper ripping and the announcement. Like, <laughs> it, it was crazy. Yeah, it's excellent. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so recent hike, Stomp, have you been out anywhere? 
uh, I've just been doing a lot of guiding, and this is actually the last weekend for the snowmobile guiding. But um, the only the only thing I've been doing is the running. So whenever I get a chance, I'm out there, and I've been hitting the Dickey Ledges, doing hill repeats on the Dickey Ledge uh, snowshoe tracks that are up there. And just today, I hit um, the Bog Pond um, trail that goes up to Bog Pond, and you start at Harvard Georgiana, mm-hmm. right, just south of Whale Tail. And uh, that's a snowmobile trail too, so it's really perfect. So I've just been putting on the, um, uh, uh, you know, hill sounds or whatever, and just running up there and running down and all that stuff, trying to dodge snowmobiles. <laughs> Have you been out? Uh, I was out the day that we did Reckless, so I went and I hiked Cannon and uh, met up with Jake. So Jake's mm-hmm. here, um, who's on the show. So I met up with him and we parked at Lafayette. Well, we dropped a car at the cannon lot so at the end Mm. of the kinsman ridge trail and then we went down to lafayette and left from there so we went from lafayette campground so we went up high cannon but um lynn and eric were hiking so i was like we'll meet up with you guys and then we met up with our new friends camilla and lance so there was a crew of like six of us to start with and then Lynn and Eric broke off when we got to like the Dodge Trail. They headed over to Lonesome Lake because Lynn wasn't feeling great. So then mm-hmm. Jake, Camilla, and Lance and me went up and did, you know, we went up High Cannon. I had told that story about how I met um, the father and son who, or the father was a listener and had named his son after Mount Lincoln, which was cool. He was a good kid. Um, yeah, it was a great day. Camilla and Lance <laughs> are awesome people. And, um, you know, the weather wasn't great, but it was fun to get that done. And, you know, that was basically number two. So I, I came into the winter with needing 18 summits to finish my winter 4,000 footer. I ended up completing 12. And then the last two weekends has just been like last weekend I was dealing with, I forget what I was doing. I think my daughter got a license and then my wife was traveling. So I, I had to take her to the airport on Sunday. So I wouldn't have been able to do it. And then the only peaks I have remaining is Owl's Head, and then I got to do that like Hill, Zealand, Bonds, Traverse. So I don't even think like the conditions are good enough. Like if I did want to do those this weekend, like it would just be, I think I'd have to break trail out to Owl's Head, I would, I would guess. Mm, possible. Yeah. Yeah, possible. Believe it or not, I mean, this snow is compressing really fast. If anybody get out there, it's it's probably doable, but... Yeah, but I've kind of resigned myself. I I had a good winter. I got those 12 summits. I went to, you know, all over the place, which was great. I got out most weekends. So I'm just going to go out. I think I'm going out on Saturday. I'm looking at something in the presidentials. I'm just Mm -hmm. waiting for the higher summits forecast to come out so I can see what Saturday morning looks clear on the prezies. But I want to see what the wind conditions look like and just make sure that it's not too crazy. And if it's not crazy, then I'm going to get up there and do something big. Nice. Sounds great. Yep. Um, hmm. But that's it for hiking. So I'll have I'll give a report next week on what I ended up doing. Excellent. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I hope to get out soon. Um, actually, you know what's funny? Uh, based upon the Golden Gator outcome, Mount Monroe was a runner-up for favorite highest peak. So Mrs. Stomp and I are planning on going out Sunday if the weather's good to do uh, Amanusik to Monroe, and we'll play it by year from there. But I think we might try to get up Monroe. Yeah. Isn't that funny? That was one of the standouts, like Mount Monroe. <laughs> it's like, it is a great little mountain. It's I just actually, like, yeah, it is a great mountain. I did, yeah. I went up Edmonds Path, and then instead of going up Eisenhower, I, I went to Monroe from Edmonds Path in the fall, and that was a fantastic hike. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful, yeah, yeah, great time. But that's the plan actually for me on Saturday. So we're planning mm-hmm. on going up Amanusik, so we may, I'll break trail for you. If we have to oh, break thank trail. you. So. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, it. No problem. <laughs> so that's that's why if people are listening, pick Sunday on the weekends to go hiking because you won't have to risk breaking trail if you're lazy like I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so notable oh, hikers. Boy. Yeah, so we have some notable hikes of the week. And if you're interested, you could tag us on your adventure to be considered for the hike of the week. So no guarantees you'll be plugged. Sometimes we get overloaded, but uh, this is not too bad this week. So we have Sam Hikes, New Hampshire, did Camel's Hump in Vermont, uh, Dave Shits in the Woods, Roberts and Faraway rated uh, three out of five shits in the woods, apparently. 
on this new scale. Um, John Calvin, 85, North and South Twin. Uh, Steve Summits did the Willard Prerequis hike for the Ty Gagney event, and so did Jennifer Lee Mountain. Um, Mike Mall did North and Middle Sugarloaf. Um, Dave comes in again doing Carisage North, Bartlett Mountain, Willie Family Burial Site, Mike. This might be interesting to visit. I, know, I saw that. I am interested. Oh, and Dave again, um, North and South Doublehead. Dave's getting out there a lot. Um, Kearsage North, and um, and then finally James Phoenix, 86, did Mount Cardigan. And if you saw the video, he captured a Blackhawk doing some training maneuvers uh, in the area. So that was really cool. And that was for his 52 with a view. Yeah, I, I, uh, I saw that Blackhawk video, which was which was awesome. Yeah, I remember being on the Sisters over by Chikora, and I walked right up to one of their landing points, and I was blown away. I actually got within, say, 15 feet before they took off, but it's nothing like being near one of those things, man. They're incredible. They sure are. And just a few more here. Uh, Rhonda Willette, 68, Mount Washington for 25 out of 48. John Adrians and Nick and Sean did South Mountain in Patuckaway State Park. Very cool place. Horrendous conditions after rain. He and the GF are huge fans. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, Nick hikes and plays guitar did Garfield, uh, which was 21 out of 48 for the winter. And uh, Summit Beer Society, Mount Willard. Pat Lorch, Moonlit Search and Rescue Training hike kern valley search and rescue thanks for listening everybody really appreciate it thank you for your service and your time your volunteerism keegs 1614 mount washington and monroe on a bluebird day for winter and then run cast run did pierce and jackson and then ham oh, ham <laughs> So, oh boy, Sam hikes New Hampshire, not Ham Sykes New Hampshire. And Sam has a really interesting warning for us. So essentially, uh, do not sit under the observation tower structure on Cannon Mountain. So they they hiked Cannon, got up around um, two hours to get to the top, and apparently Sam wasn't feeling so hot, but... They ended up sitting underneath the observation tower and apparently a giant chunk of ice fell through the tower onto the back of Sam's head. So that's pretty rough. So anybody that's up there, just be careful because it is spring and it's melting fast. So uh, Sam, I hope you uh, feel better and um, geez reading the story here it says uh she made it down fast with a lump and a killer headache to show for it uh she went to urgent care and was told it's just a concussion quote unquote (laughs) wow just a concussion hey no big deal so there you go uh let's see he got to hike with hannah that's awesome saw some mountains and got iced coffee and chicken nuggets so hey Concussion, coffee, chicken nuggets, eh, 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 it's a trade-off. Sweet Beginnings Daycare. Uh, they're located in New Hampshire. They're licensed. They're a licensed child care provider that offers care for children from six weeks to 12 years with flexibility in before and after school care as well. Sweet Beginnings aims to instill a love for learning by providing a safe and positive experience within a loving and warm environment. Sweet Beginnings also believes this is a good foundation to teach children in order to prepare them for their future. For more information, contact Sweet Beginnings at 603 568 Four five three zero. Visit them at Sweet Beginnings Daycare on Facebook or email Shandy at Shandy Elliot at Outlook dot com. Slashers hiking topic of the week. Excellent stomp. So um, on to the segment of the week, which is Franconia yeah. Ridge. 
Awesome. Just like the first few episodes. Exactly. So what we are doing is just, we're kind of going back to the first three or four episodes and just redoing them in a way that um, we feel like we didn't do them justice in the first couple of shows just because we were kind of awkwardly working out our timing and, you know, details and all this other fun stuff. But before mm-hmm. we get into Franconia Ridge Stomp, I did want to pull, like, I this was the very first episode we did. So inside the folder for the episode, I have not only the script, which is like written out in words that we would read back and forth to each other, which is kind of funny. Uh, but I also had like the style guide and concept proposal that I sent over to you, which was pretty funny. But the the most interesting thing that I found in the original script that I wrote out was that I wrote out very cool specifically for you to say. <laughs> so in, yeah, Go ahead. in the, uh, in the episode, it was like, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was just basically an intro about search and rescue. And then I, I put in the response for you to respond to me saying, very cool. I'm excited to get started talking about one of my favorite areas in the whites, Franconia Ridge. Oh, my goodness. Which is great. <laughs> and then we That's had, so silly. you know, I basically had like, you know, slant towards a comedy, irrelevant view towards topics. We're not a, mm-hmm. we're not hiking, backpacking purists. We respect the core values of leave no trace. I don't even know what that <laughs> means. And then more <laughs> topics revolve around our own personal stories, but we need to make them humorous and move quickly. So we never learned the move quickly part. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Yeah. As we approach an hour on this episode. Yes. And then my, uh, the concept thing, I said, there's no White Mountain specific podcast on iTunes or other podcasts. This podcast will be for the hardcore hiker or adventure seekers looking for local advice on the whites. Hmm. Yeah. So... Uh-huh. Not too shabby. No, no. And honestly, like when I compare sort of the format of the show now to what we had in the proposal, like it, had, it didn't deviate too much. Like our openers have definitely gotten longer, but otherwise it's pretty close. Yeah, it's fun though. Yes. All right. So Franconia Ridge Stomp. So just a quick overview. This is a nine mile loop hike in the traditional um, hike. And we're going to talk about some of the connecting trails and other ways to do this. Um, it's listed as a strenuous hike in the White Mountain Guide and um, considered one of the most epic hikes, not only in New Hampshire, but also it makes a lot of like top hiking list. Um, internationally. Yeah, internationally and globally. So it's it's part of the Appalachian Trail and most of the people that do sort of the through hikes consider like Franconia Ridge and the Presidentials as the highlight of the trail. It's fully exposed. I think it's like, what, about a mile and a half or so of fully exposed ridge up there? Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, there is a hut that's close by, the AMC Greenleaf Hut, where you can rest up and use the facilities and refill your water. And then the ridge line offers views out to um, Kinsman's and Mount Cannon to the west, and then views into the Pemi Wilderness and Presidential Range, Sandwich Range, and basically see most of the White Mountains from there, right? Yes. And I just want to add one other thing here. It's a very dangerous and deadly loop as well, depending on the time of the year. I just want to throw that in there. Yeah, it certainly is. And I think that mm-hmm. the the issue with Franconia Ridge from a safety perspective is that it's very accessible. So the trailhead um, locations are right off of Route 93. So you can literally just like drive past it, pull, out, pull off within, you know, 20, 30 feet. And then you're on the trail when you get out of your car, essentially. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people underestimate this just because it is so accessible. Mm. Yeah, visually, it, you know, people say, oh, it's right there. Let's just go do it. It's like right there. You can reach it. But the scale is, uh, you can't measure the scale of it by your car on 93. It's massive. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, a, you know, me- meandering trails. And it definitely gets a little bit tricky, um, particularly going up falling waters. I think what ends up happening is a lot of people will miss a, uh, a water crossing or they'll get sort of turned around on the trail or they'll succumb to like the slipperiness of that particular area just because the entire, regardless of what direction you go up, you're you're basically coming from the west and it doesn't get direct sunlight, especially the falling waters area. So it's very, it's very slick no matter mm-hmm. where you're, you are on falling waters. So the... 
you know, the trailhead options when you are looking to do Franconia Ridge, traditionally people would park at Lafayette. Um, and then that would take you to the trailhead that is a single trail to start with. Then it breaks off between, um, you, you can basically take a right and go up Falling Waters Trail, or you can take a left to go up Old Bridal Trail. And mm-hmm. I would say, Stomp, you, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my description of the difference between the two is that Falling Waters is much more sort of slick, rock scramble, um, more difficult to navigate because you have water crossings and um, it tends to just be really slick there, whereas Old Bridal is a little bit more gentle. It does have a couple of sections that are, are steep climbs up closer to the top, uh, but it's 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 probably a easier path up. It would be my my view, mm. at least to at least to getting to the hut. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, the way it works out, looking at the map, you start out in open woods, just more or less following the falling waters uh, contour, like around two thousand feet or so elevation, and then it it crosses over dry brook, and then just heads up through a series of uh, just massive cascades and scrambles. And Mike's right, they're they're pretty wet until you come to Cloudland Falls, which is a beautiful, what, 80-foot waterfall. Mm-hmm. And um, once you pass Cloudland, it does become more of a traditional trail um, with fairly gradual sections and then very steep sections leading up to Shining Rock, which is like 4,000 feet. So it's a big mix. But my point is the first half is fairly treacherous. And um, when you're looking at Old Bridal, it's more or less the, the I don't know, 2,700 to 3,500 feet, 4,000 feet when you get to Greenleaf Hut. So what you're dealing with there, they call them the agonies and they're just... Um, fall summit after fall summit after fall summit i believe there's probably five or six of them and um there are a couple sections within that stretch that are pretty steep and can be treacherous when wet but uh, in comparison to the wet section of falling waters it's a little more forgiving i suppose but when it comes to descending either one of these trails those two sections are are worth taking your time and being careful yeah, agreed. And I think that um, one of the things that we do see with people getting in trouble, especially the data kind of bears this out, is that we tend to see um, groups of younger people getting in trouble, tend to see people that are not from the area. So even not even like from Massachusetts or New Hampshire, you see like it's not uncommon for somebody from like Florida or um, you know Pennsylvania to get in trouble. And I think what ends up happening is that people will Google awesome hikes in the White Mountains or they'll talk to people that are local to the area and they'll get recommendations to say you've got to do Franconia Ridge because Franconia when it is a nice weather and you get up top it's an it's an amazing experience and a great hike the reality is is that you know there's not that many days where it's that great up there you know you can you can just as easily end up in like a whiteout condition situation for sure happens a lot yes yeah exactly and then Stomp I think the so old bridal and then um falling waters the other thing i'd say about old bridal is that when you get up to the green leaf hut there's another section or trail which is the it basically extends the green leaf trail so between the hut and the summit of lafayette is the green leaf trail and i think Mm -hmm. one of the call outs i'll say and we'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about some of the well-known search and rescue events that have gone on in this area that that stretch once you break tree line and you head head up to Lafayette or when you're coming down is tricky because it's open it's it's basically open above tree line you're navigating off of rock cairns and uh, there are a couple of right hand turns that you need to keep an eye on and what we've seen multiple times is that people mostly coming down there's a, there's a 90 degree turn a little bit below the summit and people tend to miss that and then they can make their way um, down into, I think that's um, Lafayette Brook. Lafayette Brook. We've also seen a number of scenarios where people that are coming down from Lafayette miss the trail turn off and they end up making their way down into Garfield Ridge instead of actually going down to Greenleaf Hot. So it's just a tricky area up there. A point of confusion is that 
old bridle becomes Greenleaf Trail at the hut. Yes. Which is interesting. And I've also seen a number of hikers as they're descending from Mount Lafayette down the Greenleaf Trail, continue down the Greenleaf Trail unintentionally when they should have gone left to Old Bridle Path. So be aware of that junction as well because you won't get back to your car. You'll be walking the highway back a Correct. good uh, mile or two. Correct, yeah. And I think from a, um, a, a safety check perspective, I think if you're going up Old Bridle, I think Green Leaf is where you want to sort of assess your conditions. And once you get to the hut, um, you've got a little bit of pre- tree line protection for about a half a mile, quarter mile before you get above tree line and you're fully exposed. That's when if you stop and you take a look around and you say, you know what, it doesn't look that great. I looked at the weather or I'm looking at the conditions in the sky. That's where you would want to say like, okay, this is where I turn around. This is going to be my safety check. And then the mm-hmm. same would go if you're going up Falling Waters, I would say your safety check is on or around Little Haystack, which is where you come up to the ridge from Falling Waters to the south and um, get above tree line. And I think that's where you can assess. On a normal day, you'll get views of, of Lincoln and Lafayette and you can see how the ridge, the, the, uh, the ridge is looking. Again, if you get up there and the, you can't see or the, you, know, you feel like the wind is significant, that's your turnaround time. Because once you commit, you've got a mile and a half or so that you've got to get across that ridge. And, and if, the, if you're not prepared for the weather, it can get ugly. Right. As def- defined in Ty's book, The Last Traverse. Correct. Uh, yeah. Classic story. Yeah, exactly. So um, from my perspective, my personal preference, if you're looking to you know, get advice on what direction to go, I personally prefer to go up Old Bridal and then go across the ridge from south uh, or from north to south and go down Falling Waters. I would say 85% of the people you talk to will tell you to go the opposite direction and go up Falling Waters just because it's a little bit safer to navigate. Um, so mm-hmm. there, there's that. I just prefer to go up Old Bridal because I like the view going south and looking at like Liberty and Flume that way. Yeah, I can, I mean, from a search and rescue perspective, people coming down Falling Waters are generally the people that we're responding to in the loop. Um, It's less common for us to go to Old Bridal Path. It's absolutely more common to go to Falling Waters. Um, In particular, just above Cloudland Falls, there's one stretch that's super slick. Uh, People tend to walk right upon this uh, rock with a 10 to 15 foot drop below it they slip and they go sliding and you know it's it's bad up there so if you are descending be super 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 careful during that wet section agreed agreed um and again like i i've done a lot of hiking been up there quite a few times and you know everyone's tolerance for going up and down trails is different i guess i have Mm -hmm. a higher tolerance but i would say you know, if you're not sure your footing, then it's probably better to go up Falling Waters. But I just, I just prefer the old bridal route. Yeah. Um, so Stomp, I guess the other things to sort of talk about is on the ridge itself, the ridge is really well marked. Uh, most of the ridge has um, rocks that guide you to stay on a particular path. So you do want to stay on the path. There's delicate uh, vegetation up there and there's a significant amount of work that is planned matter of fact last time I was up there there was somebody that was mar- um, measuring the trail and planning for some of the work that they're doing and I think they've mm-hmm. got some something like a three million dollar grant to do some work above tree line to re- redirect the trail away from some fragile vegetation up there and then I think they're doing some work in the lower portion of falling waters is that right there, there's a lot of um, work that's coming about currently. There's talk of rebuilding cairns. There's talk about signage. There's all kinds of stuff that's in the work. So uh, keep an ear open. Excellent. Um, but again, the, so the core loop, Old Bridal, Falling Waters, Green Leaf, and then the ridge itself, um, that's what people think of traditionally when you talk about Franconia Ridge. But there's a number of connecting trails and other ways that you can approach this stomp. And then there's some camping options as well. Do you want to? break down a few the amc greenleaf hut is basically 2.7 miles up old bridal path and um it's an amc hut you need reservations of course but it's literally 1.1 miles below the summit of mount lafayette which is just absolutely amazing um 
that's probably the first choice for most people. Um, in terms of camping, are you thinking Liberty Springs, Mike, or yeah, something yeah. of that nature? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, Liberty Springs is basically part of the Appalachian Trail. And there's a beautiful tent site, hammock site, uh, just below the summit of Mount Liberty, which is south of the Franconia Ridge Loop. So from Mount Haystack, you would have to go south approximately a mile uh, to the next junction. And then you would descend to this beautiful uh, campsite with fresh water. Uh, During the warmer months, there's a steward there. So that's a really nice option for you. Those are the two primary areas for rest and uh, shelter. Agreed. And then uh, as far as parking goes, I think in the summertime, you hear a lot of people that stress out about parking. They're worried about whether or not they're going to get a spot at Lafayette Campground. There is limited parking. And since they've stopped allowing people to park on 93, uh, it, it's gotten more and more difficult. But what I tell people is you should never stress about parking because you have a ton of options. There's like six different places to park along the road where you can get access Uh, And then in the summertime, they do run a shuttle from the main parking lot at Cannon Mountain. And then there's also uh, the Pemi Trail, which is a like a mountain bike walking trail that basically parallels Route 93. So you can get any anywhere you need. So if you want to park up at Cannon, take your bike down and start at Old Bridal of Falling Waters, you can do that. Uh, if you want to do a car spot, if you want to get a shuttle, you've got a ton of different options. Mm, absolutely. As far as search and rescue events go, like we said, this is a well-known area for a number of different incidents. So I pulled a few incidents that I'm aware of that have happened over the years. Uh, One of them is the situation Brenda and Russell Cox were a husband and wife that were hiking up near Lafayette in the winter. This goes back maybe 10, 15 years ago. They got off trail. I think that they were in a situation where they were hiking in high, high winds, snow conditions, and they ended up heading down towards Garfield Ridge instead of coming down to um, Greenleaf Hut. And they, I think, spent two days maybe in a snow cave. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. Brenda did not survive. Her husband did survive, but that was a a sad, scary incident. But it just sort of shows how quickly the weather can change in that region. Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, In addition to that, uh, Ty's book, The Last Traverse, the story of Fred Fredrickson and James Osborne, uh, definitely recommend picking up Ty's book to get more details on that story or check out our episodes that we we had Ty on the show to get more details. But again, that was a situation where they came up from Little Haystack, if I remember correctly. And again, right. that goes back to sort of like, okay, assess where you are, how viable the um, the conditions are, and then make your decision. They decided to go forward that day. And um, unfortunately, it uh, it didn't work out for uh, for uh, for them. So, or for Fred Fred Fredrickson, anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A um, couple of other incidents that we're aware of. There was a couple of years ago. There was two trail runners that came down from Mont Lafayette. They mm-hmm. missed that turn on um, Greenleaf, the the ninety degree turn, and ended up in Lafayette Brook. Luckily, they were they were uh, in deep, deep snow, and they were in deep, deep trouble. They lost their shoes, but luckily, they were able to get pulled out by a helicopter. But that was an extremely close call stop, right? Yes, it sure was. Absolutely super close call. I can speak to the weather on that day. The, the Blackhawk can only go out when the weather cooperates. And thankfully for these two individuals, the ceiling was literally just high enough for the cop to get in there and get these guys out. That literally could have been the difference in that story for sure. So, Yeah, they were very lucky. And then, um, of course, we've got two recent incidents that have happened. Um, There was a young lady in November that had gone up hiking. Uh, She had started up Old Bridal and was looking to do the loop Unfortunately, she got she ran into significant weather on top of Mount Lafayette, 
turned around, sort of the same scenario as the the runners and ended up down in Lafayette Brook. Again, this this turn on on Greenleaf right below Mount Lafayette is tricky. There, and there's actually three of these 90 degree turns that you got to navigate. And the first two aren't as bad, but the one up above is definitely tricky. And I actually got turned around on that one myself the first time I did a solo hike in the winter. And it's, you know, I, I was able to reposition, but it is just a tricky, tricky corner. Right. Exactly. Um, and then we had another incident on Christmas of last year where a young man was hiking. I think, did he go up Old Bridal was, and he was coming across from that way, I think? Uh, refresh my memory. What this is the is? Uh, the the young man from um, Salem, New Hampshire that had died this on Christmas Eve. Oh, the um, individual that was being monitored by family? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I I don't quite know what happened. I think he just mistook a drainage for the trail. Um, what I do know is that the the family was monitoring it, and they noticed that he went off trail, and that's when they contacted you know authorities. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but again, it's just the 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 theme here is don't push your luck on Franconia if you're not feeling it or the weather doesn't look good. And you you know you're not sure about your gear or your experience level. Just turn around. It's not worth the risk. Absolutely. Or if you're in that deadly situation, have the stuff in your pack to survive extreme conditions, extreme weather, because you may be out there for 24 hours. Yep. Sleeping pad, bivy, sleeping bag. If you know the weather's going to be crazy, stove, hot stove, water, yep, food. Yeah, all of it. Uh, all of it. You just cannot gamble up there. Exactly. Um, and then the last major incident that I want to cover here is uh, the case of Michael Miller. So Michael Miller is a young man, a uh, 22-year-old student at MIT from Weymouth, Massachusetts. He had gone hiking with two friends, headed up Old Bridal, um, November, late November, and uh, not an experienced hiker, not dressed for the weather. I don't think any of them you know, even had backpacks. And he went missing. And there was an extensive mm-hmm. seven-day search looking for him that uh, did not result in finding him. So he's presumed dead on the mountain, but he's never been located. Hmm. Yeah. So Stomp, I actually, I've been slowly collecting various books and history on the White Mountains. Matter of fact, I have enough, I think, to fill up a whole bookshelf at this point so I'm getting my collection's <laughs> getting big but I recently picked wow. up the summer of 1984 Apple uh, Appalachia magazine which is put out by the AMC mm-hmm. and they have a four or five page breakdown of the seven day search for Michael Miller so I wanted to go through some of the highlights with you and just get your thoughts here sure all right so couple of things about this this bulletin from 1984 is I'm reading through it. It's the same thing about how are we going to fund fishing game? Why does New Hampshire, you know, uh, reserve the right to charge people that are negligent? Um, all the stuff that we talk about with search and rescue is all talked about from 1984. No different. So it <laughs> uh, goes back to that theme I talked about when we were talking about, you know, the, the book from 1895. Everything yep. is the same. Nothing new under the sun. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> Anatomy of a Search from Mount Lafayette. And again, this is from the Appalachia Summer 1984 uh, Accident Summary. So, 9 p.m. on Sunday, October 23rd. So, it was October. Uh, Lincoln Police informed fishing game officials that Michael Miller, a 22-year-old man from Weymouth, Mass., had become separated from his two companions. Um one gentleman from Winthrop and one gentleman from Cambridge. They were hiking on the old bridal path on Mount Lafayette. The three men had begun hiking at 3.30 p.m. They had no experience hiking or climbing and no trail maps or equipment. They used the map on the trail sign to plan their hike. The weather at the time of departure Mm. was overcast with mixed precipitation of snow and rain. Temperature in the low 30s and dropping. Darkness was only a few hours away. Miller was wearing a black leather jacket, light brown sweater, blue jeans, brown hiking boots, and, a, and beige gloves. He was a non-smoker. 
but Miller did not have matches or fire starting material. Okay. So, so conservation officer Fred, Frederick Olson was told by uh, Miller's companions that after about 20 minutes of hiking, Miller left the trail where it makes a sharp right turn to bushwhack to the north of the trail. So stomp essentially what he did is he went in maybe about a half a mile. And then you can see on the old bridal trail, there's this like 90 degree turn at mm-hmm. around the 23 or the 2100 mark, 2100 right. foot elevation mark. Sure. And it looks like he went off trail there. And Into Walker Brook? Into not even Walker Brook. He went actually to the north of Walker Brook. Um, so he was oh. heading towards the ledges below the Agonies. Oh, wow. Like almost towards like almost towards Greenleaf Trail mm-hmm. in that way. Gotcha. Um, so on this first day, basically, um, Miller left the trail where it makes that sharp right turn to bushwhack to the north of the trail. His two companions attempted to follow but soon fell behind who was hiking much faster. So he must have been like an athlete. Um, their last voice contact placed him upslope and to the north of them. So keep that in mind, the, to the north, sure. which means he was under those ledges by the agonies. Miller yelled that he would see them on the AMC at the AMC Greenleaf Hut. The two companions found themselves back on the old bridal trail around 5 o'clock, just above the section of the trail known as the agonies. They arrived at the hut at 6 p.m. and did not see Miller there. So they made it to the, the hut in two and a half hours. They yelled for him but got no response. With darkness setting in and snow falling, they decided to descend the Lafayette to Lafayette Place. They arrived at the base of the mountain at 8.30, not seeing their companion at any time. Rain was falling and the temperature was in the low 30s. They had met three hikers on the way down and did not ask any of them if they had seen Miller. The two companions then reported Miller missing. C.O. Olson contacted Lieutenant Brian Howe and Lieutenant Bill Hastings, and the three fish and game officials determined that a night search would be fruitless and that a trail search would be organized in the morning. Um, so mm-hmm. this is that that's the incident day. Day one of the search, fish and game officials assembled at Lafayette Place at 8 a.m. on Monday, October 24th to plan a trail search. The two companions arrived at 8.30 and were told to telephone any place where Miller might have gone had he arrived at Lafayette Place and found his vehicle missing. Fishing game officials were informed that the two companions had done as requested without locating Miller. They were hoping that he may have got off the trail and got a ride. Back then, there's no cell phones, obviously. Um, But they did later learn that they did not call Miller's mother or his residence. So at 9.40... um, Fishing game COs were called in to initiate a trail search. So officers ascended Bridal Path, Greenleaf Trail, and Falling Waters. Uh, so one team descended via Skookumchuck, and then all the teams basically came back by 7.30 p.m. So they did a full-day search of those those three or four trails. Okay. So it was snowing, but was there snowpack? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. So it was a mix. It seemed like it was drizzling at the lower elevations and snowing up top. So there may not have been a, a path or track to follow. Or yeah, I don't for. think they found anything. So, um, and then they. Okay, I think so they were also like maybe they weren't committing so much. They said cloud cap at twenty five hundred feet, um, and they weren't one hundred percent committed because I think they were probably holding out hope that he had somehow gotten somewhere and got a ride and would call somebody and that he was off the mountain. So they weren't sure how big of a deal this was. Okay, so let me get this straight. So you're at the Agonies, you're heading north bushwhacking. Well, he was well under the Agonies. So the Agonies are at, um, I think they begin somewhere around 3,400 feet. It looks like he went off trail around 2,100 feet. And then he's somewhere, and the story gets a little bit tricky because at some point they do think that he crossed over the trail into Walker Brook. But we'll get to that in a moment. Huh. Okay. I was thinking if it was higher, then there may have been some reasoning to it. But I don't know why somebody would do that. That's sort of strange. It's very odd. Very odd. For sure. Um, So day two of the search, um, 15 fishing game officers, seven AMC personnel, and two Army National Guard helicopters 
are on scene. Trail searches had revealed no trace of Miller, so a decision was made to concentrate on the area where he was last known to be bushwhacking. It was theorized he may have become injured and unresponsive. So a team of six was dispatched to search the Walker Brook area. In addition to this, assuming that Miller might have crossed the old bridle path in the darkness and wandered into Rock Walker Ravine. Sure. The remaining personnel were divided into two groups to search the ledge area to the north of the bridle path. So that would be like a, underneath the agonies there. Right. Um, one group worked over the most southerly set of ledges well, the other worked under them. So they covered, it sounds like they covered sort of like 2,000 feet across. And then I don't know if they went all the way to Greenleaf Trail, but that section there is basically like just no man's land between Old Bridal and Greenleaf below. Mm -hmm. um, the search of this area, which was a likely spot for Miller, had become injured. Uh, had he not regained gained the trail, was extremely difficult. Officers repeatedly were forced to backtrack to get off ledges and outcrops. The lower group was repeatedly subjected to falling material from the slope above. These groups continued across the re the ledges coming out at 3 p.m. Ear searches didn't result in anything. So um, mm -hmm. plans were made to utilize civil air patrol personnel and the Ramapo Search and Rescue Association dog search team. So uh, at that point, after day two, they were like, "This is this is this is real. Like we got to get a big crew out here." Yeah. So day three, sixteen fishing game officers, sixty-four civil air patrol cadets. So that's how they got volunteers with civil air patrol back then. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty cool. One civil air patrol commander, two Army National Guard helicopters, seven AMC staff three dogs, five handlers, and then 19 volunteers. So mm. 8.30, uh, an area had to be cleared for 30 minutes prior to the dog search. So there was a meeting with one of the hiking companions, and then two dog search teams were dispatched to cover the Greenleaf Trail, the Agonies, and Greenleaf Hut. The remaining personnel were divided into two groups of 41 people each, organized into line search teams. One team covered north of the Bridal Path, the other the south. An additional team of 14 Civil Air Patrol cadets searched a higher elevation line and were forced down by steep terrain. The helicopters arrived at 1145 after a delay due to fog, and they resumed their search. Um, hmm. By 1230, a report was received that placed Miller at Greenleaf Hut at 5 p.m. on October 23rd, this information was passed on to the helicopter crew who then concentrated the search on Greenland. So somebody some somebody who had been hiking in that area s claimed they might have saw him at the hut. So it gets even weirder. Yeah, it does. Who knows? Hmm. Um, remaining personnel were utilized to form another line search. Um Oh, actually, so seven AMC personnel were sent to Gilhead and Garfield Ridge to check those that hut and those trails, and then hikers were encountered who had hiked the ridge trails, and none of them had seen Miller. The remaining personnel were forming another line search south of the Morning Flag Line. This group of 55 searchers covered about a half a mile and emerged from the woods at 4 p.m. Again, I think they were working north of Bridal Path. Mm -hmm. Um which and is this, brutal terrain. It's brutal, yeah. Um, Cliff faces and... Phew. Yeah, exactly. And then the dog teams finally reached the road by 7 p.m., so they were ahead. And then by day four... So day three was the big day. Day four, you have 15 fishing game officers, 10 Mountain Rescue Service volunteers, two Becker Academy volunteers, two AMC staff, three dogs, five handlers, 17 volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, and this day, there was weather issues, light snow falling. Um, the dog teams concentrated on searching near Old Bridal, and one team attempted to search the area immediately below the west-facing ledges. So, Stomp, this would be um, right into Walker Brook. So, if the theory around him crossing Old Bridal and going mm -hmm. down into Walker Brook, there was a section in here where they said that was where the dogs hit the most um, vividly, the dog something was there for the dogs. They didn't mm -hmm. track anything, but that's where the dogs reacted the most strongly. 
Um, so they were looking at that west section of Walker Brook and then um, there was a message that evening from a hiker responding to the publicity about the search who reported that he saw a man fitting the description of Miller headed up the old bridle path at 4.30 on Sunday. The thin man, the thin young man, he said, was wearing a leather jacket, no hat, and was not carrying a pack. He seemed dressed for the city, not mountain climbing, and he said hi. They didn't have any conversation. So again, that's another person coming through saying that they saw him on the old bridle path at 4.30. Mm-hmm. By day five, they've got eight fishing game officers, three mountain rescue, three AMC, 22 volunteers, and the three dogs with their handlers. Um Search areas were Eagle Cliff and the side trails in that area, Greenleaf Trail and Lincoln Brook, the first overlook below the Agonies, the Owl's Head Loop, and the Desolation Shelter, which I don't even know what that is. Um, Hmm. Mountain rescue personnel roped up and descended the slide below the Agony Overlook three times before retreating because of darkness. Again, the dog teams returned to the search area abandoned the day before and expanded the coverage. One handler suffered a sprained ankle on the descent of the bridal path. Near the end of the day, the New England Canine Search and Rescue Group arrived with two additional dogs. Their assignments would be determined the next day. Uh, Day six, dangerous weather conditions, high winds, temperatures in the teens, and light to moderate snow made it a difficult search day. Um... And then by, and they were, they were just searching some of the areas they had gone over before. By day mm-hmm. seven, the dog teams again returned to the area around Greenleaf Hut, searching both sides of the trail. The good response from volunteers to fish and game um, resulted in many hikers combing the more frequently used trails and interfering with the effectiveness of the dog search teams. So they got a bunch of volunteers out there, but they were messing with the dogs. Right. So at the, as the conditions worsened, the fishing game officials just basically called it. They said, look, he's not going to survive out here in these conditions. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's basically it. Yep. That's a hell of a story. It is, yeah. The analysis obviously was not prepared. None of them were prepared. They didn't stay together. Um, this one was one of the, um, the big search and rescue efforts that I think talked about like funding and and they also gave kudos to fishing game for being able to pull together such a big volunteer effort um over the span of several days yeah yeah um they they close with although this individual lost in new hampshire has never been found this is apparently the first such case in the white mountains since the 19th century A large group of ravens was seen in the area during a thaw period this past winter. In their macabre way, these birds may lead humans to Miller's remains. So they were speculating, you know, maybe they could spot wildlife or something like that for it. But he was never found. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. So what's your hunch? You think he's in Walker Brook or the western side of Old Brattle? I just, given his experience, I feel like he is probably on this north side of Old Bridal. I think he's probably like under this section where the agonies are. Hmm. I mean, it's a massive area. It really is. It doesn't look that bad on a map, but it's crazy when you get in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find it interesting that he was spotted on trails, supposedly. If you notice at the um, just above twenty eight hundred feet, where there's that hairpin that begins the ascent to the agonies, mm-hmm. that's an area where people tend to get confused as well. They they hit that corner and can sometimes just go straight up into Walker Brook as opposed to going left uh, if you have bad conditions or you know snowy conditions or yeah. no light. Yeah, and I think the. The thing that I question is like, yeah, if he was in the dark and he crossed the trail accidentally, then I see that happening. But I just wonder as an inexperienced hiker, he was clearly in good shape and he was a fast hiker and he could cover some distance. But 
you know, I just haven't been over that area enough to know whether or not it would get so thick that he would be like, oh, I got to turn back or whether he might've heard mm-hmm. his friend's voices closer to trail and said like, oh yeah, I got to keep, I got to turn, turn to the right to sort of stay closer to them. I just feel like he probably made his way more to the north and is in that, like, I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, he was somewhere in that 24 to 28 foot elevation range. Hmm. Somewhere in that path from Old Bridal out to Greenleaf. But who knows? Yeah, who knows? Shame. Does leather deteriorate or does it stay intact? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you, certainly the bones. But the other the other issue is it's it's so many decades later. You have all the foliage dropping and just earth covering an area. You probably wouldn't see anything. It's a proverbial needle in a haystack. Yeah. Yeah. So sad story. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, hopefully someday, some way, somebody will find something and give the family some closure. Right. That's it is amazing. wild about like how back then with no cell phone stomping, I had this happen to me. Like we went to a um, Jimmy Buffett concert and with, with my group of friends and we went in a bus and we were drinking and having a good time. And when it came time for the bus to like leave, one of our friends didn't show up and we were like, where is he? Mm-hmm. And we had to make a call and just be like, look, you know, he's leaving. There's no cell phones, no options back then. You just, we left. And then when mm-hmm. we got home, you know, we were waiting for him to call. We were like, should we call his parents' house? What should we do? So we waited. We didn't call his mother. Um, we waited the full day, the next day, and nobody heard from him. And eventually, like, I think like two days later, we went to his house and we were like, we don't know where he is. I'm not going to say his name to protect the innocence, but his mom was like, what do you mean you haven't seen him in two days? And we were like, no, we haven't seen him. He didn't show up for the bus at the concert. We don't know what happened. Hmm. Turned out that he decided to do a nature, uh, he had a nature break in the parking lot at Great Woods and he got arrested by the police because of that. So he was in jail for like two days. Oh my over the weekend <laughs> and he was he got out of jail and he didn't want his mom to find out but right, right. by us going to the house and tipping off his mom she was like she what the hell happened and yeah so he not only did he spend two days in jail because he had to go to the bathroom in the parking lot but um nobody he, had, he didn't call anybody he called his cousin i guess that lived close to mansfield and got out and he was staying with his cousin for a couple of days but we we kind of threw him under the bus with his mom so Hmm. Was that what happened here at the, with this story? Was this a bathroom break and he went off trail? Hey, I got a bushwhack. I'll be right back. I don't think so. I think no. he was just, I don't know. I don't think that they were thinking at all. 3.30 Three, <laughs> in the afternoon and a crappy, I don't think they knew anything. I don't know, think That's they knew so what they weird. were doing. Yeah, bizarre. Back sweat sucks in all types of weather and hikes. Not only is it uncomfortable, but sweat is a risk factor, causing your core temperature to fluctuate if it doesn't evaporate off your back. Check out Vaucluse's Cool Dry Backpack Airflow Frame, a backpack accessory that installs on your favorite pack sizes 18 liters to 65 liters and creates an airflow gap between you and your pack. Whether you're in hot or cold temps, even if you have a pack with a curved frame, the Cool Dry Frame is a real game changer when it comes to airflow. So visit VaucluseGear.com to order a Cool Dry Frame today. So um, I would say that this this new story stomp for me holds the record of the most like sh- we get a lot of like when a rescue happens like we get I get emails from I'll get it from twenty five people. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> this one holds the record of like the most shared um, rescue that I've received. So search and rescue and thank you for everyone. Keep come keep sending them. I absolutely don't not send them because I say that I appreciate it and. It's, it's, uh, send me, send me the message, but search and rescue mm-hmm. team saved two lost hikers in Mount Washington state forest during a nor'easter. Um, after a nearly nine hour overnight search and rescue mission, the two hikers were rescued. So this is the Mount Washington out in Western mass, not, uh, not Correct. Mount Washington. So high winds, heavy, heavy falling snow piled up on Mount Washington state forest. Two hikers found themselves lost in Tuesday night's darkness, unable to see the forest trail markings. Nine hours and one search and rescue mission later, the two hikers arrived at the Mass Department of Conservation Recreation Headquarters. Mm -hmm. 
So these these hikers were 47 and 53. They called Berkshire County Sheriff's Dispatch Center to report that they could no longer see the Allender Trail signs due to heavy snowfall and gathering darkness. The dispatch center forwarded the call to the state police Lee Barracks, who told the hikers to stay where they were. Hmm. So DCR officials worked to pinpoint the exact location of the hikers. State police assembled a team of state police units, and then um, Egremont and Sheffield firefighters, state environmental police, and DCR rangers all made their way to the Egremont um, Fire Department. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing Egremont incorrectly, so just feel free to let us all know that I pronounce it wrong. Um, but 11.15, a separate group of first responders and crews had cleared the roads between the command post and the trail entrance. And at that point, two troopers... Well, a bunch of people arrived at the trail entrance on snowmobiles, but the, due to the mm-hmm. depth of the snow, they couldn't use their snow. What do you do when there's too much snow with a snowmobile stump? You just got to walk. I mean, the problem with the snowmobiles around here, they're they're made for touring. They're made for like groomed trails. So they're, they're actually fairly useless when it comes to deeper snow. What, do they sell snowmobiles that actually will like break trail? No, but they're... A snowmobiles that are made for deeper snow. Just it's that simple. It it depends on the tread underneath. Got it. Interesting. So anyway, so yeah. it, the rescue teams hiked in, but two and a half hours they hiked in. By two thirty in the morning, the team found the men. Uh, hikers were suffering from fatigue and cold temperatures, but they were not injured. Eventually, the group arrived at headquarters, located near the trail entrance. They examined the two men and took them to the local hospital for further evaluation. So, ten and a half hours later, all troopers were cleared from the command post. And as this mission was playing out, there was two young skiers that were saved in Central Mass. Uh, these two boys had ventured outside of Wachusett Mountain skiing boundaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may or may not have done that in my days, but uh, two miles from any civilization during Tuesday's storm, with their phone batteries below nine percent. Luckily, the young boys were saved, and I'm sure that their parents are pissed. Mm-hmm. So, but they were very lucky and used their heads and shared body heat to survive. So, good job, young men. Yeah, there you go. So, yep. mass, uh, mass in the um, the section here, two in a row. Yes, more or less the same area too. You know, southwest Mass. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Mount Washington State is a little bit farther west, but it's all. Anything past Mount well, 495 is all the same. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so, yeah, we got some national stories, but we'll, we'll save those for next week. And uh, that's all I got, Stomp. So three more episodes, then we get to retire. Woo! Yeah, we're going to get a guest on soon. I'm getting sick of just talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not a problem. Yes. We have quite the cue. Yeah, we'll get some guests going soon. So thank you, everyone, and have a good good day. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S L A S R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots, and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Neelan, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared. And I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.